that was past tense, you know, it's, it's overdue, you know. A lot of things happened in the last nine months of our relationship, and I, I wasn't happy with it, so we just parted our ways. Soon after that, the temperamental fighter dismissed his longtime trainer, Bill Miller. Bill Miller had said some derogatory things about me in the magazines, which he could have came back to me. He said, she not, you know, said to me, my face, instead of going behind my back, like a coward. I just blew up and went into his face and told him, you know, he has to take a hike, he's gone, he's fired. Now 28 years old, living in Las Vegas, the boxer who has been in too many kitchens and too many nightclubs, his own worst enemy, has been trained for the last year by Eddie Mustafa Muhammad. Mustafa, a former light heavyweight champion, had his own problems as a fighter making weight. He has a nutritionist, right? And then he has myself that's going to be on him. I mean, there was times when he told me he never did road work or he never hit the heavy bag. I couldn't believe that. Though he seems happy enough with his new trainer, James Tony isn't quick to praise anyone other than himself. Eddie, with me or, with me, with me or not, I'm still going to be successful. I was successful before I got with Eddie, I'm going to continue to be successful. The teacher and his pupil disagree on the significance of tonight's rematch with Montel Griffin. This fight is very important. Instead of, it's a crossroads fight. I mean, Montel got the decision over James, you know, and uh, I don't even want to think about him losing. I ain't on the crossroads because I'm not old. I'm not old now. I'm not old over here. If James Tony wins tonight, he'll take a step toward his goal of a title rematch with Roy Jones at 175 pounds. Cock as he is, he, he scared of me. This point man, he scared of me. He scared to death. Because you know what, this time I'll be right, I'm going to kill him. Despite having languished in obscurity for the past two years, James Tony clearly hasn't lost any confidence in himself. He's eager to predict a future far greater than his past. You know, if I have a heavyweight title, win a cruiserweight championship, and if I have a heavyweight championship, and win it. I'm going to accomplish this all within the two and a half year range. By the time I'm 30, I'll be the heavyweight champion of the world. James Tony, an ambitious agenda to make his two-year nightmare go away and fulfill his lofty dreams, he must first avenge his loss to Montel Griffin tonight. If he doesn't, the nightmare only gets worse. And we bring you back live to ringside at the Lawler Events Center in Reno, Nevada. Tale of the tape for Montel Griffin and James Tony. James with a five-inch height advantage. Both have gained nine pounds since the weigh-in yesterday. So tonight, Griffin weighs 182 and Tony weighs 184. As they go into the ring, Tony also with a four-inch reach advantage. Punch that numbers, Larry. And these numbers will show you something unusual about Griffin. Not the overall percentage of punches thrown. You can see Griffin throws fewer punches. He is the counter here. But when you look at the jabs, you see that despite his height and reach disadvantage, he throws more and lands more jabs. Rolls to the bout with our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. The James Tony Montel Griffin fight is scheduled for 12 rounds. There is no standing gate count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight, and he cannot be saved by the bell in any round, including the 12th and final round. Jim. All right, thanks very much, Harold. Montel Griffin to make his entrance into the ring. Dean 92 Olympian, as Larry pointed out. Lost a close decision in Barcelona, or else he would have left there with a medal. Montel tells us that he loves the spotlight, loves the camera. Loves everything about all of this stuff, including the money. He's getting a $500,000 purse tonight, by far his biggest purse ever. But says he's still mad because he hasn't gotten all that he wants. He has gotten 25 consecutive wins as a professional, but as the graphic showed you, the 10 opponents he has beaten since the win over James Tony have a combined record of 150. 52 wins and 160 losses. So you must say that the 25-0 record has been rolled up against extremely questionable opposition. And of course, the only thing questionable about tonight's opposition is the physical condition of James Tony. It's always an issue every time he fights. And while 
Tony looked good yesterday in our meeting and enters the ring tonight at a reasonable weight of 184, nine pounds over what he weighed in yesterday at 175. There are rumors that he weighed 209 pounds as recently as four or five weeks ago. This has been yet another crash diet training exercise for James Tony. I want to focus for now, Jim, on that belt that somebody is raising behind him. There are so many belts and so many divisions. They are, it's virtually like going to the five and 10 cent store to buy one. I was surprised to see this belt in his room yesterday. It's from something called the WBU. So from now on, I'm gonna find myself calling the one man we all know to be the champion in his division, the champion, and everyone else, a belt holder. <laughs> Because that's what James Tony is in the light heavyweight division now. He's a, a belt, belt holder. holder. All right. And there's the record for belt holder James Tony. 53 wins, two losses, two draws, 35 knockouts. You can see the former two-time champion. He won world championships at 160 pounds and at 168. And now let's go up to ring announcer Mark Barrow for the pre-fight introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Lawler Event Center in the biggest little city in the world, Reno, Nevada, for an evening of HBO Championship Boxing. Under the promotion of Top Rank Incorporated in association with Budweiser, proud to be your bud, matchmaker Bruce Trampler. Tonight's bouts are under the auspices of the Nevada State Athletic Commission. The chairman is Dr. Elias Granham and the attending executive director, Mark Ratner. Ring officials assigned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Your ringside physicians are Dr. James McLennan, Dr. Joseph Heflin, and Dr. John Wickman. Your timekeeper this evening is the sensational Steve Menzel. Counting for the knockdowns at the bell, the jolly one himself, John Rogers. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Top Rank Incorporated, in association with Reno Sparks Convention and Visitors Association, and Budweiser, the undisputed king of beers, presents HBO Sports main event of the evening, 12 rounds for the WBU Light Heavyweight Championship of the world. Ring officials assigned by the World Boxing Union, President John Robinson, Chairman Ed Levine, Supervisor in attendance, the dandy one Don Hazelton. Your judges at ringside are from Carson City, Nevada, Keith McDonald, from Las Vegas, Nevada, John Rupert, and from Virginia City, Nevada, Doug Tucker. Your referee for this event from Reno, Nevada, refereeing his 92nd World Championship fight, Mills Lane. <laughs> Introducing now the principals first in the blue corner to my right, the challenger wearing the ice blue trunks, weighing in at 173 pounds. He is undefeated in 25 professional bouts. He has 18 wins by way of knockout. He hails from Chicago, Illinois, Montel Ice Griffin. Griffin. His opponent in the red corner, wearing the dark gold trunks, weighing 175 pounds. His professional record, 53 victories, two defeats, two draws. He has 35 knockouts. He hails now from Las Vegas, Nevada, the WBU light heavyweight champion of the world, James Lights Up. championship of the world. All right, gentlemen, we've always gone through the instructions of the dressing room one time. Protect yourself at all times. Any questions from the challenger? From the champion? Let's get it on! Since 
two years ago, Griffin has added two years of important experience to a young fighter. Tony appears to me at least to be in better shape than he was the first time. Does this make for a better fight? We'll see. Montel Griffin with an extremely unorthodox style. He'll duck to one side and then throw a punch with the other hand. He will eliminate the jab from his repertoire for long periods and try to lead with hooks. Then he comes back and starts over with the jab. James Tony starts out conventionally, but he can do it all. He can counter, he can lead, he's a hard puncher when he's right. Tony is doing this time that he didn't do the last time. He's jabbing Montel to his body. The left hand is very effective to the stomach. Then he goes back on top. So you'd like to see him starting out with that left jab to the body, and there it was. Well, sometimes the fighter have to establish I can touch you by going to the body. And he's waiting for Mattel, Montel as though Montel has an equally long jab as his when he does not have to. He doesn't. Griffin stepping in closer and pumping his jab twice in the closing rounds of the first fight. James Tony was trying hard to set up a big right hand but never could land it. Griffin was elusive and he uses that height to his advantage, George. Very elusive. Tony in the last time around was trying to land one and two shots at a time. Now he knows that Montel can recover quickly, so keep winning round after round. I have to believe, George, that the key for James Tony is the body punching. When he's been great in some of his major triumphs in the past against Prince Charles Williams and against some of the other good fighters he's beaten, Michael Nunn, he was brutal to the body, and there's a good combo up top by Montel Griffin. And this time around, Montel Griffin punches has a little more sting to them than the first round of the first fight. I like that, a little power this time. He's got to get Tony's respect. Griffin likes to lean back and tempt you to come in. Then he tries to counter. Or lead like that. That's something new that Tony has brought here. If Montel Griffin tends to spin out to his right, you saw Tony trying to nail him with the right as he turned. As we go to the corners between rounds, you're looking at two corners loaded with boxing talent. In James Tony's corner, you have Miguel Diaz working with trainer Eddie Mustafa Muhammad. In Griffin's corner, the legendary Eddie Futch working with Fel Torrance, who will be training Riddick Bowe next Saturday night in Atlantic City. Those are four men deeply steeped in boxing knowledge. Loosen up a little bit, a little tight. Use that jab, double it, faint and jab, double the jab. He's trying to count on the jab now. Who is it? Man, go to the body and turn with him and dig that left hook. That's all you got to do. The jab is our key. Pump it all day, baby. They ain't used to that. Let him run and duck and dip. He got to fight. Keep that jab on him at all times. That's what's going to win us to fight. Easy. He don't want to fight. He don't want to fight. He don't want to fight. James Tony, following instructions from Eddie Mustafa Muhammad, threw 38 jabs in round one and connected on 15 of them. That's the jab activity that Tony's corner wants to see throughout the fight.
We've seen Tony uh, do that before. He tends to square up a little bit and get off balance, but that was a legitimate punch. No doubt about it. Griffith surprised him. Griffith somehow has come up with some power from somewhere. Well, plus he hits you from those odd angles with punches that you don't always see coming, George. Now, Tony is going to have to be consistent. Keep that jab going to the body. Hard right hand by Tony. Because Griffin is able to counter when you jab him because you're taller. He's accustomed to countering up high, but not to the body. And that's a hard thing for a young fighter to get hit hard and then go back to your original tactical sticking with your tech Tony beginning to revive the jab staying upstairs with the jab in this round now he goes back down to the body and Griffin counters over it with a left hand Montel Griffin throwing fewer punches than James Tony, but making his count. There's a wild miss. Griffin this time is coming in to show him power. This time there's a lot of power in that left hook, and he understands if he steps to Tony's right a bit, Tony is defenseless. Go on the left side of Tony, and he just doesn't seem to have any mobility. So Griffin should move to his right or to his left? Uh, to uh, Griffin should move to his right. To, to his, his right. right beyond Tony's left hand. Tony just doesn't seem to function on that left side. And Tony a little slow there to remove himself from range as Montel Griffin was able to get him with the second shot after missing the first. Sometimes when you leave with a good hook like that, it tells you what this guy's plans on doing all night. You see how easy this is? You see how easy it is? Hey, pop to him. You gotta give me some more jam. It's so easy. It's so easy. He wanna turn you and spin you. He's a survivor right now. All right, what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You gotta pump some more jab. That right hand's gonna come. Get him used to the jab. Keep stepping in. Hands up, James. And stop going back. Let's see that short punch that materialized when they were in close early in the round. Well, it was not a punch that landed very solidly. It looked like Jones, what uh, Tony was off balance after throwing punches of his own, and that Griffey just touched him and pushed him off balance. And yet something like that can influence the officials. That's true. But James Tony, a different fighter technically tonight than in the first fight. In the first fight, he averaged 16 attempted jabs per round. In the first two rounds of this fight, he's averaging 40. So he's more than doubled his jab output. And George, that's good for Tony, right? I think that's good for any fighter who want to really maintain you you're taller use that jab whenever he throws that jab there's no way he can be countered on top of it he has the reach advantage Montel. occupying griffin occupying griffin with the jab much of the time go ahead george griffin he gets low and he gives you the illusion that hey i can hit you but if you stay your distance he can't counter you have the reach advantage take advantage of it indeed most of griffin's offense depends on you coming in at it he drops his hand. He gives you the illusion that I'll hit you if you miss. Believe me, he can't. You have to get to his range. Get a little closer so he's able to hit you. But whenever Griffith moves to his right, Tony is, has no defense for that move, for that step. There it was. Griffin stepping around to James Tony's left side and firing a right hand over the top of Tony's left shoulder. Tony with nothing to offer in return. Trainer Eddie Futch said he wanted Montel Griffin to conduct this fight in wide circles around the outside of the ring. Keep moving James Tony laterally so that he can't set his feet. And that's exactly what he should be doing now.
with a little counter left hand in there by Griffin. Tony acknowledged to us that in the first fight against Griffin, he had trouble setting his feet to try to land a right hand. Another balance lost by Tony. He threw a good right hand and tried to jump back, but he almost fell backwards. It's only because Tony does not like to come back with his hook. After you throw that right hand, come back with a left hook. does not want to get back with that left hook to get his position back. Why is he having so much trouble with his balance, George? That's it? Yeah, you got to come back with your left hook to get your balance back, and he's just sitting there right hand and nothing else. Straight left hand lands for Griffin. James Tony seeming to have lost continuity here in the latter stages of round three. Not quite sure what to do with Montel Griffin, who is hopping and scoring. And that happens a lot when a, a big heavy puncher gets in with a guy who's quicker. You tend to want to throw one punch and jump back rather than throwing three punches and stay where you are. Interesting fight. Tactical battle. Shifting tides of fortune as round three comes to a close. When you step around, throw that hoop. Well, let's just see if we can pick up uh, what Tony is doing here. Uh, he just can't find it. Look, he, Larry, George, he just can't even find. And not only that, you watch Griffin's uh, left foot. It's on the outside of Tony's foot. He keeps it right there on the outside. And that's the problem. You cannot allow a fighter to get on the outside of your left foot. All right, watch Why? your balance. You got to steer him. Keep your left foot in between him. It's like steering a car. But once he gets his foot on the outside, you've lost him automatically. And you're going to miss with your left hook. And in that overhead shot, you could see exactly where Griffin's foot was, carefully positioned to the outside of James's lead foot. Which is an old trick, and you would wonder why Tony's corner hasn't caught on to it. Tony's punch out foot dropped precipitously in round number three as he had more and more trouble finding Griffin in there. Griffin moving more and more toward his right, away from James Tony's left hand, which, as George Foreman points out, befuddles the former two-time champion. Now Griffin Tony, moves back in the other direction. Tony is allowing him once again to get, uh, Montel is getting his left foot on the outside of Tony's left foot. You cannot allow him to do that. You're going to miss him every time with a left hook, or even with a jab. That's a good point. There he goes again, Griffin putting his foot on the outside of Tony's lead foot and cracking a right hand over the top of Tony's shoulder. And this is why you not only have corner people, you should have scouts on the outside of the ring going back to the corner, telling them what's going on. Because well, Eddie Futch said yesterday that oftentimes in a rematch, George, you have a harder time getting your fighter to follow a fight plan because he's seen the opponent, he has his own ideas about what to do, but Montel Griffin appears to be following a fight plan to the letter here. That's true. But the one thing about keeping your left foot on the outside of your opponent, it takes a lot of effort, and believe me, it start hurting those stomach muscles pretty quick. Griffin looking at Lane and saying, I got hit with a low blow. Meanwhile, Tony landed a hard right hand to count to punctuate that exchange. Good straight left hand in tight by Griffin. Tony comes back with a left and a right. Tony has to be very careful not to go looking for a knockout. You let a knockout come to you. If you're a puncher, you don't have to stress, get stressed out. Now Montel Griffin is having to reach around to the left side. Now he's not able to keep that balance, keep that foot around there with as effortlessly as he did the first time, a couple of rounds. James Tony picking up the pace just a little bit. Starting to throw more punches again as he did in the first couple of rounds. But Griffin still countering effectively. Now, if Tony is going back to the old James Tony, you let the guy grab you and you grab his arm and wait for a big shot. 
He has to go back to the left jab. Montel Griffin committing much more to his punches tonight than was the case in the first okay, fight. You're absolutely right, George. He's trying to make a power impression on Tony. He's got a big line down the back on his back that shows you there's power there now, muscle. Big dent in the back. You can't do jack shit. He's scared of you? Now let's give you some body shots. Bend your legs inside. Get, get a little close to him now. Bend your legs inside and let your hands go now. All right? Let your hands go and keep the pressure on. You feel like a champ, right? I uh, know it, baby. Give him some water. I like that. Keep the jab on him. Inside close. Bend your legs and fire both hands to the body. And keep that right hand up for his left hook. He don't want to fight. He want to survive. That's all he want to do. Here's what George is talking about with Griffin's left foot. You can see him moving to the outside of Tony's left foot from time to time. But there you saw Tony move back to his left and that enabled him to throw that punch. Did I get that right, George? Beautiful. <laughs> George is always thrilled when Larry and I managed to grasp a technical point. Letterman, how do you have it scored? Jim, the first I don't know. Maybe I'm watching a different fight. 39-37, three rounds to one, James Tony. Jim, let me tell you something. As a judge, I always look for this effective aggressiveness. I think that James Tony is punching awfully harder because of the fact that he's moving forward. And I don't see how Montel can get any power whatsoever spinning to the side and moving backwards. He doesn't set his feet. He's punching off the, off the back foot. And he got there, James nails it like he did just there with that right hand. I think Tony's winning the fight so far. Three to one, Tony. I have it 2-1-1 one, and one for Tony. Incidentally, this can be an awful difficult fight to score, Jim. I started to say, uh, I think both of you guys scored the fight for Tony on February 18, 1995 as well. And, and you weren't that far from, you know, normal perception because a lot of people thought that fight could have been a draw or a Tony victory. It was a very difficult fight to score. Yeah. Tony has a tendency after, after he's hurt a guy over and over, he stopped piling up points and he started looking for a knockout. He can make an awful bad mistake after 12 rounds. He's landed the most powerful punches, but not enough. Points count. Well, and it's a bad piece of strategy because James Tony's knockouts invariably come from accumulated punishment. He's not the kind of guy who will put a man down with one blow unless he's punished for a long period of time. Got in a hard right hand there. That's right, but he didn't come back with a left hook. He let Montel, as a matter of fact, hit him back. He used to have that left hook to the body. Where'd it go? Well, Montel has got good footwork. He doesn't allow you to just set up and come back with, after you've hit him with one shot. Like that. Come on, work out. Whenever Tony is moves his left jab, it's a different fight altogether. When he stops and starts plotting alone, then it's another fight. Montel has got a good right hand. He's just not using it. I don't know why. Griffin almost switched southpaw there and turned back to the conventional stance. Both fighters promised that they would switch into southpaw stances at some point during the fight, but neither man has done it so far. Hard to get comfortable enough to do something like that with both first fighters left hook. Yep, there the was the left hook, and he got it. Yep. Griffin wasn't ready for it. Tony with a clean left hook shot. But he has to go back and get more points. Don't start looking for a knockout, because this guy recovers. As he showed you right there with the fast recovery and a straight right hand inside. you can walk straight back, okay? And don't go the same way all the time. Go this way and then cut off. Now, when you get ready to cut off, all you get to the bump, you just walk right around to the side. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Don't let him walk past your left hand. Give him the left hand in the face before he gets there, okay? All right. All right, Phil. When you, when you're working those time. Griffin calls himself Ice, calls this the Ice Age. 
Here you see Tony trying to crack the ice. And for the first with time, a left hand. He faked the right hand. Oh, now, baby. Fainted with the right. Came up pressure. with the left. Ben, so when that's a tactic we're likely to see again. Hey, you the old fake. Tony has a tendency Herb. to stand up fairly straight and somewhat stiff-legged. In the first fight, trainer Eddie Mustafa Muhammad said oh. it was his biggest failing, that he didn't bend his knees and get down to Griffin's level enough. You know, we could go into all kinds of technicalities about what happened in that fight, but basically, Tony ran out of steam in the last three rounds because he was winning the fight up until then. And right now, it appears that the only issues are does he have the conditioning to fight most of every round, most of every minute of every round? Or two, will he trip over those impossibly long trunks? But his left jab is excellent this time. He goes up to the head only after he's established the reach with the left jab to the body. Griffith is holding the right hand back as though it's a big weapon. He should be landing a lot more. Very smart of Tony, although he's hurt him a few times. He goes back to the left jab. Do we see anything here, in your opinion, George, that would say that a rematch with Jones could have a different scenario? That boy Jones operates so well on the left side of his opponent. He's not only good when he's standing in front of you, he moves over there and gives you something. He makes you, he hurts you. He's got things together. He's hard to find, and he finds you. Did I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> In a manner of speaking. Yeah. But Tony is doing an excellent job tonight. If only he piled up points. You just can't win these things just because you landed a heavier punch. Tony's corner should tell him to get alert, win these rounds, stand up. Watching Griffin fight reminds me of what it used to be like back in the 60s, watching Juan Marichal pitch. Every punch comes from a different angle. None of them are orthodox. Hard left hand. Tony puts his head down as if to say, no, nah, you didn't hurt me at all, but Montel Griffin piling up points with exchanges like that. Very good combination, his best of the fight. You never can count Griffin out. Though you've beat him, though you've whipped him and hurt him, he still has something left. Tries to make you miss and counter. Well-conditioned fighter, too. Now, all of these things happen because Tony deserted his left jab. All right, watching the bout live with us in Pensacola, Florida. You saw him two Friday nights ago here as he scored a unanimous decision over Mike McCallum at 175 pounds. His brand new light heavyweight belt holder, Roy Jones Jr., also the world champion at 168 pounds. Roy, very briefly, what do you think of what you've seen in the first half of this bout between Montel Griffin and James Tony? Uh, Montel started out with a very good strategy, which was to stay to James Tony's left. He was doing very good with that in the beginning, but now he seems to be getting away from that. I don't know if James Tony hit him with that little short right hand and changed his mind or what may have happened. But now he's staying more in front of James Tony, and this is where James Tony is at his best. This allows James Tony to do more of what he likes to do. What do you think will happen next? I don't know. It's according to who keeps their fight plan. If Griffin goes back to get into the outside, Tony, he would be okay. If he doesn't, then Tony will eventually knock him out. All right, thank you very much, Roy, and thanks for being with us. We'll come back to you at the end of the bout for a more general discussion of the light heavyweight division. And, of course, and one of the subjects there will be what happens to the man who wins this fight. Larry? I thought uh, Roy gave us an excellent capsule analysis of this fight. Echoing some of the things that George Foreman has been telling you throughout the bout about how effective Griffin is 
when he stays to Tony's left and how effective Tony is when he's able to jab and throw the right hand behind it. Montel Griffin's only had one knockout pass the sixth round in his whole career. That was against the ultra skinny Matthew Charleston a little bit earlier this year, not in James Tony's league. So you don't expect Griffin to score a knockout beyond this unless Tony makes some horrible mistake. Tony, on the other hand, has had some stirring late round knockouts because he's able to accumulate punishment over the long course of the fight. What kind of that guy? What kind of that guy? I want to step back. Hold. Step back. Wait, here we go. Let me go. Come on. Here we go. Hold. But Griffin has some power that he hasn't even shown yet with a good right hand. So he can land a good right hand. He hasn't even tried to go to the body effectively yet. In the first fight, Griffin swelled up around the left eye, and he seems to be getting just a tiny bit of swelling around that same eye right now. Probably not enough to bother him at this point. We'll watch it as the fight goes on. Tony is doing so well with that left jab. I you wonder why he stopped. As though he thinks it's a crime to win a fight with your jab. Tony with some damaging body punches there. And for a moment, Griffin was frozen as James clocked him with the right hand. Body punches setting this up. Griffin stopped to complain to the referee a little bit. And Tony just said, hey, protect yourself at all times. Griffin tripping over Tony's feet as he fired that barrage of punches and he comes back with a straight left hand. So certainly Montel has regained his senses after seeming to wobble a little bit from that Tony barrage in the middle minute of the round. Good combo by Griffin to finish the round and stare daggers at one another before walking back to the corners. All you got to do is bend and punch to the box. You ready to get up out of there, Jay? You making a break. Let's 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 All right? Sit and punch to the box. You got to suck it up now, man. He's ready to get up out of there. Get that punch up a little bit, Jimmy, okay? Jimmy? Oh, okay, he's ready to go. Sit, punch to the box. But the important thing is a jam. That's the most important thing in Arsenal. If he misses, then you go right back with your jam. Double that jam. Come with your hook. And when, really, you, really. and when you're working on the inside, don't stand up too straight. This is, this is the sort of prize fight in which one good flurry in a round can decide the round. That wasn't it. Early in the round, Tony landed a very good flurry. This is at the end, just before the bell, when Griffin responds, but perhaps too late. Statistically, both fighters watched their connect percentages rise in round number seven. Tony landed 36 out of 66 punches in a particularly accurate round. Griffin, 25 out of 52. That's not bad. Harold Letterman, how do you have it through seven? Jim, five rounds to two, 68-65, James Tony. I still like the effect of aggressiveness. I still think he lands the cleaner, harder shots coming forward, and I still think Montel Griffin, most of the time, punches off the wrong foot. And I have it four, two, and one for Tony. We wonder if Griffin has another speed because he may have to look for another speed as this fight goes along. He carries his left hand so low there's no way you can miss him with your jab. He puts his right hand just on the side for a right hand, but not for the jab. If Tony would continue jabbing, he can win this fight hand down. But Griffin's got to make him pay when he misses. Good left jab by Griffin.
punch out foot going down now as he slows the pace just a little bit in round number eight. Griffin sticking the jab out there, and when Griffin is able to beat Tony to the punch with the jab, James tends to stop punching. Uh, the left jab is your most best. Why would a good right hand also, but if you keep your left jab, it's the closest punch to your opponent. He, he has no protection. He can only block it for a second. Why use the right hand when you effectively get the left jab? And you saw Tony there going back to the strategy that served him so well in the first couple of rounds. Jab to the body, then jab upstairs. Jab to the body, then jab upstairs. And Griffith does absolutely nothing when Tony jabs him to the body. Nothing. But whenever Tony lands a right hand, Griffith is coming back. He's going to always hit him back. Tony just a tiny bit short with a right hand that... Could have done a lot of damage. Right, get off that neck, Montel. Come on, let's go. Get him up. Jump here. Come on. Come on, Jimmy. Come down there. Come on. Get him up. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. National treasure referee Mills Lane, appealingly uninvolved through most of the evening, getting a little bit more into the fray now as the two fighters come into closer and closer quarters as round eight comes to an end. Whenever you spin around, you step in. Don't step away from it. You, 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 you got it. Big down and suck this shit up, man. Don't give this guy no opportunity, no window for nothing, man. Pump the jab. Step to the man. Step to the man. Let's go to work, man. We got to go to work, man. Step to him with the jab. And then the hammer's going to come. Move your head. Be smart boxing there. Step to him. Don't back one step. Watch your balance in there. You got to watch your balance. You see, you're walking away from him when you don't have to. He want to take his time walk up. He want to fight his own pace. In case you're wondering you why up. we you haven't to gone into up. Griffin's to corner, up. it's because Eddie Futch would not wear a mic for us. You know, many people, myself including, included, said uh, during and after the recent Holyfield-Tyson fight that uh, Tyson didn't have a plan B. Uh, and I'm wondering now whether Griffin has a plan B because plan A isn't working. Griffin is extremely fast. Tony has got to understand that he's only going to get hurt when he throws that right hand and doesn't come back with the left hook. As long as the jab is out there, he's safe. You yeah, he heard Eddie Mustafa Muhammad pleading with Tony to throw more jabs. Sometimes that's what you have to do is make these guys do it. You, they've got it in them. Months and months of training. Why hold it back? Griffin has a counter punches mentality, which is to say when Tony punches him, either he wants to get out of there or look to punch after Tony punches. He doesn't want to move in on Tony, where he can really get some leverage and do some damage. He doesn't want to be inside, George, and he's going to have to be there to do something. But well, he's kind of uh, afraid because Tony is so effective when you walk to him a little bit. Griffith evidently is well schooled enough to know that. Yeah, but it ain't so how working. Do you do it? So how do you do it without doing it? <laughs> well, but it ain't working. No, it's not working. <laughs> fight all the way each man with tiny stretches of effective aggression based on those moments when the fight comes to them Tony lands a big right hand over the top Griffin has some of the most remarkable recover power I've ever seen you hit him hard and he's gonna hit you back 
that regard, he's kind of a light heavyweight Evander Holyfield. Holyfield recovers faster than any heavyweight I've ever seen. Montel's pretty much the same way. Yeah, you can expect if you hit him with a right hand, Montel is going to come back and hit you. But if you jab him, he seems to say, okay. Lead left hook from Griffin landed. Now Tony gets in a couple of close quarters punches. Round nine coming to a close, and just as was the case on February 18, 1995, our scorers, Harold Letterman, our unofficial ringside scorer, Larry Merchant, who likes to track it along with him, both of them think James Tony's winning the fight. He was winning the fight two years ago at this juncture also. But once again, we remind you, in rounds 10, 11, and 12, on February 18, 1995, Montel Griffin took all three rounds on all three judges' scorecards to come from behind and win the fight. Tony says, I was in terrible condition. I was sloppy. I'll be better this time. Oh, wait. You got to yeah. right here, okay. Use that jab. Stay as close to him as you possibly can. Right. Yeah, when, you, when you take away his punching range, he, he, he can't get anything else. Okay, sir. When, when you're way outside, the guy can get, get those long punches off. Get your together, baby. We go all day. This ain't nothing. Now let's go. Yeah, you heard what Eddie Fletch was saying. I must have heard it from Eddie Fletch myself in the past. He was saying you must come inside and not just always go outside. But Griffin's mentality as a counterpuncher is to stay outside unless he's jumping in to hold on as he is now. Incidentally, you're right. Eddie's not wearing a microphone, but his co-trainer, Thel Torrance, is. And that's why we've been getting good, clear audio out of Montel Griffin's corner. He's going to have to make a war out of this to change the complexion of the fight. And I think that's what Eddie Futch is communicating to him in technical terms. Now the referee allowed him, Montel, to push Tony behind the back. You can really change the whole fight like that because they can get dirty on one another. Well, as much as most people think of Mills Lane and his refereeing style, you've told me, George, in the past that you think he sometimes allows fights to get out of control. Yeah, as soon as one of these guys do something, you've got to admonish them right quick, don't do that again. These things can get dirty. So maybe he just didn't see it that way, huh? For Griffin, the strategy is obvious. Stay inside or stay wide. If he stays inside or stays wide, he can be effective. When he stands here and allows Tony to jab in that effective punching range for James, it's Tony's fight. Hard right hand inside for Tony. Griffin comes back with a left hook to the rib cage. All right, oh, 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 get back Griffin is making that step to, to his right, but he's not throwing a punch when he does it. You're going to step over to your left, take a punch along with you. This fight, not all that much different from the fight they fought in February of 1995. The only difference to my eyes, James is just better tonight. Came out, picked his hands up and started boxing to start the fight himself. Another lap jab that Tony's landing to the body is starting to hurt Griffin. James Tony, whose career was severely damaged by the back-to-back -back losses to Roy Jones and this man, Montel Griffin, in 94 and 95, trying to get back to the top of the heap and coming up with an effective tactical effort so far here tonight. At least that's the way we see it. You see, once again, Tony lands a good right hand. Montel Griffin comes back and hit him good. But there you also saw it capsule why the fight is going the way it is going. When Griffin landed a, a nice left hook, he just oh, got a smile hey, from Tony hey, because Griffin just doesn't punch hard enough to change the complexion of this fight. Give me the water. Two more rounds. Pick it up more. I didn't. It was a good round, but I know you can pick it up more. All right? Hey, can I pick it up more? Clean that mouthpiece. Give me some more. Give me some more rounds. All right? 
Let's take a punched at look at a comparison of the last fight, February 18, 1995, to this one. And you can see punches through round 10. James Tony landing at a higher percentage tonight. Montel Griffin landing at a lower percentage tonight. But neither fighter throwing as many punches tonight as was the case the first time around. And that's not unusual in a rematch when the two fighters know each other so much better. Right, George? I have a tendency to say, I'm going to save that. He, he got away from that last time. I'm not going to do this again. You know, at the top of the show, Jim, you asked me, what, what is the point of this rematch? And so far, it's been to show whether Tony, when he's properly motivated and in the best shape he can get in, uh, can win a fight against a pretty slick, clever fighter. And, and he's doing it right now. I still believe the best shape that Tony can get in is middleweight. I agree with you, George. Harold Letterman through 10 rounds. What you got? Jim, 97, 93, seven rounds to three, James Tony. I just don't, I just keep saying, he keeps walking him down, walking him down, taking it to him, just landing those hard jabs and the right hands underneath. James Tony is starting to walk, walk to him, not doing anything. You've got to throw punches. You can't let seconds go by and allow the guy to steal a round from you. When Tony Mundell walks, should Mundell, do that. Come on, come on. When Tony no, walks to on. Griffin and doesn't do anything, Griffin is able to step to the side and land. And I can't see why Griffin doesn't steal it. I Just slap it, hey, slap hey, it. Hey, hey. No, hey, Tom, no push off. Well, just get back here. Come on, come on. Slapping ain't going to get it anymore, George. You'd have to hit him about 500 slaps around. <laughs> <laughs> Good left hook by James Tony on the button. Backs Griffin up a step or two. One shot like that makes you slap happy. I get the feeling I've, I've seen every sequence in every round before by now. And the ice is melting. Must leave you in a fever pitch of excitement, right, Larry? Can't you tell? Now you see Tony's lip is bleeding from that punch he got in the way in. That's right. He little, showed us the top lip previously, but it was the bottom lip that was hurt. Yep, little cut inside the uh, lip on the right side of the mouth. That came from the punch that Griffin landed at the end of the press conference dust up the other day. And Tony might be bleeding from that just a tiny bit. Good eyes, George. get overconfident. Hey, I've won every round. I can coast now. All right, when back, Doesn't you work like that. Back. These we judges see back. differently. Tight, tight. He's going to try to steal it. You got to give me all you got now. He's going to try to steal this here. You hear what I'm saying? No, I don't need that. Never. Never. Give it a one. Hey, he's going to try to steal it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Get ready, Jay. Get that. When the man is on camera last round. When the man, we got to walk till you use that jab. Why, why? Yeah, here's that jab. Double the jab once in a while. Yo, we straight. But I want you to, to, to steal the show, hold the show like a championship. You hear what I said? Huh? All right, Indeed. don't Indeed. get lazy in there. Give him a drink of water. Don't take all those steps back. Okay. The guy giving you all these double shots inside. But just do it smartly. My, my, my. Okay, I got you. Three minutes. Go. Come on. Okay, perfect. Three minutes. That's right. Three minutes, champ. Three minutes, champ. Okay. Three minutes, champ. Okay. What Tony has shown tonight is that, like Junior Jones, who came back after shockingly losing two fights, he is young enough and eager enough to want to get back into the hunt. And we checked earlier today with the leading fight odds maker down in Las Vegas, Herb Lembeck, and he said in a rematch, 
between Tony and Jones. If Tony looked fit and ready tonight, that Jones would be about a three to one favorite, and Jones would be close to a five to one favorite over Virgil Hill. And those are about the closest odds anybody can see for any future opponents uh, on the horizon for, G for uh, Roy. He's going to be favored against anyone he fights unless he happens to go up to heavyweight and ask for Evander Holyfield or George Foreman or, or any other heavyweight uh, who might don't, be up don't there. Don't cover yourself. You're doing okay. <laughs> you know what? Tony is not doing what his corner told him to do. Tell him to get out there. Don't allow this guy to steal the show. And he's waiting back like he did in the first fight. Well, the, the truth is neither puncher is throwing enough punches to earn himself a clear victory in this round. In the last round, Griffin only threw 42 punches. And if he was going to steal the fight in the late rounds, he would need a bigger output than that. But you don't want to be in a position where you're hitting him back. You want to be in a position where he's trying to hit you back for what you've just done to him. Minute and a half to go in the 12th round. Is James Tony? Less than 90 seconds away from the next step in his path toward redemption? Or is Montel Griffin on the verge of another stunning upset? We'll find out when this goes to the judges in 70 more seconds. There's a rumor we only have one set of judges for this fight, Jim. Is that correct? One. <laughs> It's unusual, huh? The reference last is to, week. Yeah, the reference is to two weeks ago in Florida when two sets of judges were required between Roy Jones and Mike McCallum, one from the state of Florida and one from a governing body. Well, the WBC was right at that time to look for officials from outside of Florida. Tony should pick up his feet and act energetic even if he's not. That's what the crowd is saying. Win the last round. Win the last round. McGriffin should just take over and just go, go. What in the world is Griffin doing? Does he think he's won this fight? Oh, yeah. Look at the good footwork. Well. There's the bell. That's the end of the bell. It appeared to me to be a solid and almost completely dominating performance by Tony. And I repeat. But I am the first word, not the last word. Last time around, scoring. last time around, these HBO scorecards went in favor of James Tony as well. And then the Nevada judges confounded us by going in exactly the opposite direction. So let's bring in Harold Letterman for what may or may not be an accurate look at what the Vegas judges Jim, are. Jim, I'll tell you, I absolutely have to agree with Larry Merchant. 117, 111, nine rounds to three, a solid win for James Tony. You know, it's clean punching and effective aggressiveness. James just carried it to him. He walked him down, he backed him up, he whacked him with the left jab, hit him with some tremendous hooks to the body. Then Mike kept throwing those leaping punches like Floyd Patterson used to throw. And he was so off balance when he landed. I just think he won very few rounds. On the other hand, Tony, solid punching. He carried the fight. He deserves the victory. George Foreman, you agree? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. It went pretty much like Harold, uh, Harold Letterman see it. I see it in the same fashion. But Griffith finished the second round, I mean the last round on his feet with footwork. And maybe the judges think, hey, maybe he did win. Mm -hmm. All kind of things can happen in these boxing matches. Watch your Watch your Eddie. Watch your Eddie. Don't Yeah, I can't go back. Well, right now let's go to ring announcer Mark Barrow for the official decision of the judges. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the decision of the judges. Judge John Rupert scores it 116-112. Judge Keith McDonald scores it 116-112. Judge Doug Tucker scores it 119-109 for the WBU Light Heavyweight Champion of the World, Montel! Griffin!